Hello and welcome back to Classic Books of Star. Lily's back there. And just as a reminder, if you would please subscribe, like, comment, hit the notification bell. And today we're going to get back to Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. We are on chapter 23. Should read chapter 23 and 24. In the next video we will summarize chapters 19 to 24. But I wish Bob Yule wouldn't chew tobacco was all Atticus had said about it. According to Miss Stephanie Crawford, however, Atticus was leaving the post office when Mr. Yule approached him, cursed him, spat on him, and threatened to kill him. Miss Stephanie, who by the time she had told it twice was there, seen it all, passing by from the jitney jungle she was. Miss Stephanie, Stephanie said Atticus didn't bat an eye, just took out his handkerchief and wiped out it, wiped his face and stood there and let Mr. Yule call him names. Wild horses could not bring her to repeat. Mr. Yule was a veteran of an obscure war that, plus Atticus's peaceful reaction, probably prompted him to inquire, Too proud to fight you, Negro-loving bastard, Miss Stephanie said. Atticus said, No, too old, put his hands in his pockets and strolled on. Miss Stephanie said, You had to hand it to Atticus Finch. He could dry, he could be right dry sometimes. Chairman, I didn't think it entertaining. After all, though, I said, he was the deadest shot in the county one time. He could. You know, we couldn't carry, wouldn't carry a gun. Scout, he ain't even got one, said Jim. You know, he didn't even have one down at the jail that night. He told me having a gun around is an invitation to somebody to shoot you. This is different, I said. We can ask him to borrow one. We did, and he said nonsense. Dill was of the opinion that an appeal to Atticus's better nature might work. After all, we would starve if Mr. Yule killed him. Besides, he raised exclusively by Aunt Ale Besides, be raised exclusively by Aunt Alexandra. We all know the first thing she'd do before Atticus was under the ground. Good, good would be to fire Calpurnia. <coughs> Jem said it might work if I cried and flung a fit. <coughs> Being young and a girl, that didn't work either. <coughs> but when he noticed us dragging around the neighborhood, not eating, taking little interest in our normal pursuits, Atticus discovered how deeply frightened we were. He tempted Jem with a new football magazine one night. When he saw Jem flip the pages and toss it aside, he said, What's bothering you, son? Jem came to the point. Mr. Yule, what, is ha what has happened? Nothing's happened. We're scared for you. We think you ought to do something about it. Atticus smiled wryly. Do what? Put him under him under a peace bond? When a man says he's going to get you, look, looks like he means it. He meant it when he said it, said Atticus. Jem, Jem said, if you can stand in Bob Ewell's shoes a minute, I destroyed his last shred of credibility at that trial, if he had any to begin with. The man had, had to have some kind of comeback. His kind always does, so spitting in my face and threatening me saved Mayella Ewell one extra beating that somebody I'll gladly that's something I'll gladly take. He had to take it on somebody, I'd rather it be me than that house full of children out there, you understand? Jem nodded. Aunt Alexandra entered the room as Addix was saying. We don't have anything to fear from Bob Ewell. He got it all out of his system that morning. I wouldn't be so sure of that Atticus, she said. His kind would do anything to pay off a grudge. You know how those people are. What on earth could bu could Jewel do to me, sister? Something furtive, Aunt Alexandra said. You may count on that. Nobody has much chance to be furtive in Maycomb, Atticus uh, answered. After that, we were not afraid. Summer was melting away, and we made the most of it. Atticus assured us that nothing would happen to Tom Robinson until, until the higher court reviewed his case and that Tom had a good chance of going free, or at least of having a new trial. He was at Enfield Prison Farm, 70 miles away in Chester County. I asked Tom Atticus if Tom's wife and children were allowed to visit him, but Atticus said no. If he loses his appeal, I asked one evening, what'll happen to him? He'll go to the chair, said Atticus, unless the governor commutes his sentence. Not time to worry yet, Scout. We've got a good chance." Jem was sprawled on the sofa reading Popular Mechanics. He looked up. It ain't right. He didn't kill anybody if he was guilty. He didn't take anybody's life. You know rape's a capital offense in Alabama, said Atticus. Yes, sir, but the jury didn't have to give him death. If they want, wanted to, they could have given him 
Gave him 20 years. Given, said Atticus. Tom Robinson's a colored man, Jem. No jury in this part of the world is going to say we think you're guilty, but not very. On a charge like that, it was either a straight acquittal or nothing. Jem was shaking his head. I know it's not right, but I can't figure out what's wrong. Maybe rape shouldn't be a capital offense. Atticus dropped his newspaper beside his chair. He said he didn't have any quarrel with a rape stat statute, none whatever, but he did have deep misgivings when the state asked for and the jury gave a death penalty on purely circumstantial evidence. He glanced at me, saw I was listening, and made it easier. I mean, before a man is sentenced to death for murder, say, there should be one or two witnesses. Someone should be able to say, yes, I was there and saw him pull the trigger. But lots of folks have been hung, hanged on circumstantial evidence, said Jem. I know, and lots of them probably deserved it, too. But in the absence of eyewitness, says there's always a doubt, sometimes only the shadow of a doubt. The law says reasonable doubt. But I think an defendant's entitled to the shadow of a doubt. There's always the possibility, no matter how improbable, that he's innocent. Then it all goes back to the in, to the jury, then. We ought to do away with juries, Jem was it adamant. Mm -hmm. Atticus tried hard not to smile, but couldn't help it. You, you were rather hard on us, son. I think maybe there might be a better way. Change the law. Change it so that only judges have the power of fixing the penalty in capital cases. Then go up to Montgomery and change the law. You'd be surprised how hard that, that'd be. I won't live to see the law changed. And if you live to see it, you'll be an old man. This was not good enough for Jem. No, sir, they ought to do away with juries. He wasn't guilty in the first place, and they said he was. You have been on that jury, son, and 11 other boys like you, Tom. Would it be a free man, said Atticus. So far, nothing in your life has interfered with your, your reasoning process. Those are 12 reasonable men in everyday life. Tom's ju jury. But you saw something come between them and reason. You saw the other, the same thing that night in front of the jail. When that crew went away, they didn't go as reasonable men. They went because we were there. There's something in our world that makes men lose their heads. They couldn't be fair if they tried. In our courts, when it's a white man's word against a black man's, the white man always wins. They are ugly, but those are the facts of life. It doesn't make it right, said Jem solid, solidly. He beat his fist softly on his knees. You just can't convict a man in evidence like that. You can't. You couldn't, but they couldn't did. The older you grow, the more of it you'll see. The one place where a man ought to get a square deal is in a courtroom. Be he any color of the rainbow, but people have a way of carrying their resentments right into a jury box. As you grow older, you'll see a white, white men cheat black men every day of your life. But let me tell you something, and don't you forget it. Whenever a white man does that to a black man, no matter how who, no matter who he is, how rich he is, or how fine the man, family comes from, that white man is trash. Atticus was speaking so quietly, his last word crashed on our tears. I looked up and his face was vehement. There's nothing more sickening to me than a low-grade white man who will take advantage of Negro's ignorance. Don't fool yourselves. It's all adding up in one of those days. These days we are going to pay the bill for it. I hope it's not in your, your, your children's time. Jem was scratching his head. Suddenly his eyes widened. Atticus, he said, why don't people like us and Miss Marty ever sit on juries? You never see anybody from May come on a jury. They'll all come from out in the woods. They all come out. They all come from out in the woods. Atticus leaned back in, the, in his rocking chair. For some reason, he looked pleased with Jim. I was wondering when that that had occurred to you. He said there are lots of reasons. For one thing, Miss Marty can't serve on a jury because she's a woman. I mean, women in Alabama can't. I was indignant. I do. I guess it's a, to protect our frail ladies from sort of cases like Tom's. Besides, Atticus grinned. I doubt it if we'd ever get a complete case tried. The ladies, it, it'd be interrupting to ask questions. Jim and I laughed. Miss Marty on a jury would be impressive. I thought of old Mrs. Debosi in her wheelchair. Stop that rapping, John Taylor. I want to ask this man something. Perhaps our forefathers were wise. Atticus was saying, wish people like us that saw our share of the bill. We generally get the juries we deserve. Our stout Maycomb citizens aren't interested in the first place. In the second place, they're afraid. Then they are afraid why, asked Jem. Well, what if, say, 
Mr. Link Dees had to decide the amount of damages to avoid, say, Miss Marty when Miss Rachel ran over her with a car. Link wouldn't like the thought of losing either lady's business at a store, would he? So he tells Judge Till that he can't serve on the jury because he doesn't have anybody to keep store for him while he's gone. So Judge Taylor excuses him. Sometimes he excuses him wrathfully. What did it make him think either one of them, one of them would stop trading with him, I asked. Jem said, Miss Rachel would, Miss Marty wouldn't, but a jury's vote secret, Atticus, how father chuckled. You've many more miles to go, son. A jury's vote supposed to be secret. Serving on a jury forces a man to make up his mind and declare himself, clear himself about something. Men don't like to do that. Sometimes it's unpleasant. Tom's jury show made up its mind in a hurry, Jem muttered. Atticus's fingers went to him, his watch pocket. No, it didn't, he said, more to himself than to us. That was the last thing, that was the one thing that made me think, well, this may be the shadow of a beginning. That jury took a few hours. In an inevitable verdict, maybe, but usually it takes them just a few minutes. This time he broke off and looked at us. You might like to know that there was one fellow who took considerable wearing down in the beginning. He was raring for an outright acquittal. Who, Jim was astonished. Atticus's eyes twinkled. It's not for me to say, but I'll tell you this much. He was one of our old Sarum friends. One of the Cunninghams, Jim yelped. One of, I didn't recognize any of them. You were joking. He looked at Atticus from the corners of his eyes. One of their connections. On a hunch, I didn't strike him. Just on a hunch. Could have, but I didn't. Golly, Moses, Jem said reverently. One minute they are trying to kill him, and the next they are trying to turn him loose. I'll never understand those folks as long as I live. Atticus said you just had to know him. He said the Cunninghams hadn't taken anything from or, off, from or off of anybody since they migrated to the New World. He said the other thing about them was once you earned their respect, they were for you, you tooth and nail. Atticus said he had a feeling, nothing more than a suspicion that they left the jail that night with a considerable respect for the Finches. Then, too, he said it took a Thunderbolt plus another Cunningham to make sh one of them change his mind. If we'd had two of that crowd, we'd have had a hung jury. Jem said, So you mean you actually put on the jury a man who wanted to kill you the night before? How could you take such a risk, Atticus? How could you? When you analyze it, there was a little risk. There's no difference between one man who's going to convict and another man who's going to convict. Is there? There's a faint difference between a man who's going to convict a man who's a little disturbed in his mind. Isn't there? He was the only uncertainty on the whole list. What kin was that man to Mr. Walter Cunningham? I asked. Atticus rose, stretched and yawned. It was not even our bedtime, but we knew he wanted a chance to read his newspaper. He picked it up, folded it, and tapped my head. Let's see now, he groaned to himself. I've got it. Double first cousin. How can that be? Two sisters married two brothers. That's all I'll tell you. You figure it out. I tortured myself and decided that I married Jem and Dill. Had a sister. When he married our children, we'd be double first cousins. Gee, Minetti, Jem said when Atticus had gone. They're family folks. Do you hear that, Auntie? Aunt Alexander was hooking a rug and not watching us, but she was listening. She sat in her chair with her work basket beside it. Her rug spread across her lap. My ladies hooked woolen rugs on, bullying, on boiling nights never became clear to me. I heard, heard it, she said. I remember the distant, disastrous occasion when I rushed to young Walter Cunningham's defense. Now, was I, now I was glad I'd done it. Soon... School starts. I'm going to ask Walter home to dinner. I planned having forgotten my primitive, my private resolve to beat him up the next day, time I saw him. He can stay over sometimes after school, too. Atticus could drive him back to Old Sarum. Maybe he could spend the night with us sometimes, Aunt. Okay, Jim? We'll see about that, Aunt Alexander said, a declaration that was, that with her was always a threat, never a promise. Surprise. I turned to her. Why not, Annie? They're good folks. She looked at me over her sewing glasses. Jean Louise, there's no doubt in my mind that they're good folks. But they are not our kind of folks. Jean says she means they're a yappy scout. 
Jem says she means they are yappy, Scout. What's a yap? Aw, oh, tacky. They are like fiddling and things like that. They like fiddling and things like that. Well, I do too. Don't be silly, Jean Louise, not Alexandra. The thing is, you can scrub Walter Cunningham till he shines. You can put him in shoes in a new suit, but he'll never be like Jem. Besides, there's a drinking streak in that family a mile wide. Finch women aren't interested in that sort of people. Aunt Lisa Jem, she ain't nine yet. She may as well learn it now. Aunt Alexander had spoken. I was reminded vividly of the last time she had put her foot down. I never knew why. It was when I absorbed, was absorbed in plans to visit Calpurnia's house. I was curious and interested. I wanted to be her company to see how she lived, who her friends were. I might as well have wanted to see the other side of the moon. This time the tactics were different, but Aunt Alexander's aim was the same. Perhaps this was why she had come to live with us, to help us choose our friends. I would hold her off as long as I could. If they're good fat folks, then why can't I be nice to Walter? I didn't say not to be nice to him. You should be friendly and polite to him. You should be gracious to everybody, dear, but you don't have to invite him home. What if he was kin to us, Auntie? The fact is that he's not kin to us. But if we were, my answer would be the same. Auntie Jem spoke up. Atticus says you can choose your friends, but you can't. You show sure can't choose your family, and they are still kin to you no matter whether you acknowledge them or not, and it makes you look right silly when you don't. That's your father all over again, said Aunt Alexander, and I still say that Jean Louise will not invite Walter Cunningham to this house. If he were her double first cousin once removed, he would still not be received in this house unless he can't come to see Atticus on business. Now that is that. She had said, indeed not, but this time she would give her reasons. But I want to play, play with Walter, Auntie. Why can't I? She took off her glasses and stared at me. I'll tell you why, she said. Because he is trash. That's why you can't play with him. I'll, ha I'll not have you around him, picking up his habits and learning Lord knows what. You're enough of a problem to your father as it is. I don't know what I would have done, but Jem stopped me. He caught me by the shoulders, put his arms or arm around me, and led me sobbing in fury to his bedroom. Atticus heard us and poked his head around the door. It's all right, sir, Jem said gruffly. <coughs> it's not anything. Atticus went away. Have a chew, Scout. Jem dug into his pocket and extracted a Tootsie Roll. It took a few minutes to work the candy into a comfortable wad inside my jaw. Jem was rearranging the objects of his dre on his dresser. His hair stuck up behind and down in front, and I wondered if it would ever look like a man's. Maybe if he shaved it off and started over, his hair would grow back neatly in place. His eyebrows were becoming heavy, and I noticed a new slimness about his body. He was growing taller. When he looked around, he must have thought I would have start crying again, for he said, Show you something if you won't tell anybody. I said, What? He unbuttoned his shirt, grinning slightly. Well, what? Well, can't you see it? Well, no. Well, it's hair. Where? There, right there. He had a, been a comfort to me, so I had said it looked lovely, but I didn't see anything. It's real nice, Jim. Out of my arms, too, he said. Going out for football next year, Scout. Don't let Auntie aggravate you. It seemed only yesterday that he was telling me not to aggravate Auntie. You know, she's not used to girls, said Jim. Leastways, not girls like you. She's trying to make you a lady. Can't you take up someone or something? Hell no, she doesn't like me. That's all there is to it, and I don't care. It was her call to Walter Cunningham trash, Walter Cunningham trash that got me going, Jim. Not what she said about being a problem to Atticus. We got that all straight one time. I asked him if I was a problem, and he said not much of one, at most one that he could always figure out, and not to worry my head a second time about bothering him. No, it was Walter. That boy's not trash, Jim. He ain't like the heels. Jem kicked off his shoes and swung his feet to the bed. He propped himself against a pillow and switched on the reading light. You know something, Scout? I've got it all figured out now. I've thought about it a lot lately, and I've got it figured out. There's four kinds of folks in the world. There's the ordinary kind like us. The neighbors, there's the kind like the Cunninghams out in the woods. Kind like the Yules down at the dump and the Negroes. What about the Chinese and the Cajuns down yonder in Baldwin County? I mean in Maycomb County. The thing about it is, our kind of folks don't like the Cunninghams. 
Nottinghams don't like the Yules, and the Yules hate and despise the colored folks. I told Jem if that was so, then why didn't Tom's jury made up of folks like the Cunninghams acquit Tom despite the Yules? Jem waved my question away at be, as being infantile. You know, he said. I've seen Atticus pat his foot when there's fiddling on the radio, and he loves pot liquor better than any man I ever saw. Then that makes us like the Cunninghams, I said. I can't see why Auntie... No, let me finish. It does, but we're still different somehow, Atticus said. One time, the reason Auntie's so hipped on the family is because all we've got is background and not a dime to our names. Well, Jem, I don't know. Atticus told me one time that most of this old family stuff's foolishness because everybody's family's just as old as everybody else's. I said that, said, did that include the colored folks and the Englishmen? And he said, yes. Background doesn't mean old family, said Jem. I mean, it, I think it's how long your family's been reading and writing, Scout. I've studied this real hard, and that's the only reason I can think of. Somewhere along, what, long when the Finches were in, in Egypt, one of them must have learned a hieroglyphic or two when he taught his boy. Jem laughed. Imagine Auntie being proud her great granddaddy could read and write. Ladies pick funny things to be proud of. Well, I'm glad he could, or or who to taught Atticus and them. And if Atticus couldn't read, you and me would be in a fix. I don't think that's what background is, Jeb. Well, then how do you explain why the Cunninghams are different? Mr. Walter can hardly sign his name. I've seen him. We've just been reading and writing longer than they have. No, everybody's got to learn. Some Nobody's born knowing that Walter's as smart as he can be. He just gets held back sometimes because he has to stay out and help his daddy. Nothing's wrong with him. No, Jem, I think there's just one kind of folks. Folks. Jem turned around and punched his pillow. When he settled back, his face was cloudy. His, he was going into one of his declines, and I grew wary. His brows came together. His mouth became a thin line. He was silent for a while. That's what I thought, too, he said at last, when I was your age. If there's just one kind of folks, why can't they get get along with each other if they're all alike? Because humans are innately insane. Why do they get out of their way to despise each other? Scout, I think I'm beginning to understand something. I think I'm beginning to stand, understand why Boo Radley stays shut up in the house. It's because he wants to stay inside. Chapter 24. Calpurnia wore her stiffest, starchest, starched apron. She carried a tray of Charlotte. She backed up to the swinging door and pressed gently. I admired the ease and grace with which she handled heavy loads of dainty things. So did Aunt Alexander, I guess, because she had let Calpurnia serve today. August was on the brink of September. Dill would be leaving from Meridian tomorrow. Today he was off with Jem at Barker's. Eddie, Barker, Eddie. Jem had discovered with angry amazement that nobody had ever bothered to teach Dill how to swim, so skill Jem considered necessary as walking. They had spent two afternoons at the creek. They said they were going in naked and I couldn't come. So I divided the lonely hours between Capernia and Miss Marty. Today, Aunt Alexander and her missionary circle were fighting the good fight all over the house from the kitchen. I heard Miss, Mrs. Grace Merriweather giving a report in the living room and the squalid lives of the Maroonas. It sounded like to me they put the women out in huts when their time came. Whatever they, they that was, they had no sense of family. I knew that that a distressed auntie. They subjected children to terrible ordeals. When they were 13, they were crawling with yaws and earworms. They chewed up and spat out the bark of a tree into a com communal pot, and men got drunk on it. Immediately thereafter, the ladies adjourned for refreshments. I didn't know whether to go into the dining room or stay out. Aunt Alexander told me, told me to join them for refreshments. It was not necessary that I attended the business part of the meeting. She said it bore, she said it had bore me. I was wearing my pink Sunday dress shoes and a petticoat and reflected that if I spilled anything, Calpurnia would have to wash my dress again for tomorrow. This had been a busy day for her. I decided to stay out. Can I help you, Cal? I asked, wishing to be of some service. Calpurnia paused in the doorway. You be still as a mouse in that corner, she said, and you can help me load up the trays when I come back. The gentle hum of ladies' voices grew louder as she opened the door. <clears throat> Why, Alexander, I never saw such Charlotte, just lovely. I never can get my crust like this. 
Never can. Who'd have thought of little dewberry tarts, Calpurnia? Who'd have thought it? Anybody tell you that the preacher's wife? No. Well, she is, and that other one's not wa walking yet. They became quiet, and I knew they had all been served. Calpurnia returned and put my mother's heavy silver pitcher on a tray. This coffee pitcher is a curiosity, she murmured. They don't make them the, the, these days. Can I carry it? If you be care careful and don't drop it, set it down at the end of the table by Miss Alexandra. Down there by the cups and things. You gotta, She's got to pour. I said, pressing my behind against the door as Calpurnia had done, but the door didn't budge. Grinning, she held it open for me. Careful now, it's heavy. Don't look at it and you won't spill it. My journey was successful. Aunt Alexandra smiled brilliantly. Stay with us, Jean Louise, she said. This was a part of her campaign to teach me to be a lady. It was customary for every circle hostess to invite her neighbors in for refreshments, be they Baptists or Presbyterians, which accounted for the presence of Miss Rachel, sober as a judge. Miss Marty and Miss Stephanie Crawford, rather nervous. I took a seat beside Miss Marty and wondered why ladies put on their hats to go across the street. Ladies in bunches always filled me with vague apprehension and a firm desire to be elsewhere. But this feeling was what Aunt Alexander called being spoiled. The ladies were cool and fragile pastel prints. Most of them were he heavily powdered but unrouged. The only lipstick in the room was tangy natural. Cutex natural sparkled on their fingernails, but some of the younger ladies wore rose. They smelled heavenly. I sat quietly, having conquered my hands by tightly gripping the arms of the chair and waited for someone to speak to me. Miss Maudie's gold bridge work twinkled. You are mighty dressed up, Miss Jean Louise, she said. Where are your britches today? Under my dress. I had meant to be funny, but the ladies laughed. My cheeks grew hot as I realized my mistake, but Miss Maudie looked gravely down at me. She never laughed at me unless I meant to be funny. In the sudden silence that followed, Miss Stephanie Crawford called them across the room. What you going to be when you grow up, Jean Louise? A lawyer? No, I hadn't thought about it, I answered, grateful that Miss Stephanie was kind enough to change the subject. Hurriedly, I began choosing my vocation. Nurse, aviator, well, why shoot, I thought you wanted to be a lawyer. You've already commenced going to court. Ladies laughed again. That's Stephanie's a card, somebody said. Miss Stephanie was encouraged to pursue the subject. Don't you want to grow up to be a lawyer? Miss Marty's hand touched a touch mine. I answered mildly enough. No, I'm just a lady. Miss Stephanie eyed me suspiciously, decided that I had meant no impertinence, and continued and contented herself with, Well, you won't get very far unless you start wearing dresses more often. Miss Marty's hand closed tightly on mine. I said nothing. It's warm was enough. Mrs. Grace Merriweather sat in my lap, and I felt it would be polite to talk to her. Mr. Merriweather, a faithful Methodist under duress, apparently saw nothing personal in singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It was the general opinion of Maycomb, however, that Mr. Mrs. Merriweather had sobered him up, made a reasonably useful citizen of him. For certainly, Mrs. Merriweather was the most devout lady in Maycomb. I searched for a topic of interest to her. What did you all study this afternoon, I asked. Oh, child, those poor marooners, she said, and was off and few other questions would be necessary. And was off. Few other questions would be necessary. Mrs. Merriweather's large brown eyes always filled with tears when she considered the oppressed, living in that jungle with nobody but J. Grimes Everett, she said. Not a white person will go near him, but that saintly J. Grimes Everett. Mrs. Merriweather played her voice like an organ, Every word she said received its full measure. The poverty, the darkness, the immorality, nobody but J. Grimes Everett knows. You know, when the church gave me that trip to the campgrounds, J. Grimes Everett said to me, Was there, ma'am? Was he there, ma'am? I thought. Home on leave, J. Grimes Everett said to me. He said, Mrs. Merriweather, you have no conception, no conception of what we are fighting over there. That's what he said to me. Yes, ma'am, I said to him. Mrs. Everett, I said, the ladies of the Macomb, Alabama Methodist Episcopal Church South are behind you 100%. That's what I said to him. And you know, right then and there, I made a pledge in my heart. I said to myself, when I go home, I'm going to give a course on the Maroonas and bring J. Grimes Everett's message to Macomb. And that's just what I'm doing. Yes, ma'am. When Mrs. Merriweather shook her head, her black curls jiggled. Jane Louise, she said, you are a fortunate girl. You live in a Christian home with a Christian folks 
Christian town. Out there in J. Grime Everett's land, there's nothing but sin and squalor. Yes, ma'am, sin and squalor, that was that. What was that, Gertrude? Mrs. Merriweather turned on her chimes for the lady sitting beside her. Oh, well, well, I always say, forgive and forget, yeah, forgive and forget. The thing that church ought to do is help her lead a Christian life for those children from here, for those children from here on out. Some of the men ought to go out there and tell that preacher to encourage her. Excuse me, Mrs. Merriweather, I interrupted. Are you all talking about Mayella Yule? May? No, child, that's Darkie's wife, Tom's wife, Tom. Robinson, ma'am? Mrs. Whit Merriweather turned back to her neighbor. There's one thing I truly believe, Gertrude, she continued, but some people just don't see it my way. We just let them know we forgive them, that we've forgotten it, then this whole thing will blow over. Ah, Mrs. Merriweather, I interrupted once more. What'll blow over? Again, she turned to me. Mrs. Merriweather was one of those childless adults who find it necessary to assume a different tone of voice when speaking to children. Nothing, Jean Louise, she said in a stately lar Largo. The cooks and peeled hands are just dissatisfied, but they are settling down now. They grumbled all the next day after that trial. Mrs. Merriweather faced Mrs. Farrow, Gertrude. I tell you, there's nothing more distracting than a sulky darky. Their mouths go down to here. Just ruined your day to have one of them in the kitchen. You know what I said to my Sophie, Gertrude, I said? Sophie, I said, you simply are not being a Christian today. Jesus Christ never went around grumbling and complaining. And you know, it did her good. She took her eyes off that floor and said, No, Ms. Merriweather, Jesus never went around grumbling, I tell you. Gertrude, you never ought to let an opportunity go by to witness for the Lord. I was reminded of the ancient little organ in the chapel at Pinch's Landing when I was very small. And if I had been very good during the day, Atticus would let me pump its bellows while he picked out a tune with one finger. The last note would linger as long as there was air to sustain it. Mrs. Merriweather had run out of air, I judged, and it was replenishing her supply while Mrs. Farrow composed herself to speak. Mrs. Farrow was a splendidly built woman with pale eyes and narrow feet. She had a fresh, permanent wave, and her hair was a massive, tight gray ringlet. She was the second most devout lady in Maycomb. She had a curious habit of prefacing everything she said with a soft, sibilant sound. S Grace, she said, it's just like I was telling Brother Hugh Hudson the other day. S Brother Hudson. I said, looks like we're fighting a losing battle. Losing battle, I said, S it doesn't matter to him one bit. We can educate him till we are blue in the face. We can try till we drop to make Christians out of them, but there's no lady safe in her bed these nights, he said to me, Mrs. Fairway, I don't know what we are coming to down here, so I told him that was certainly a fact. Mrs. Merriweather nodded wisely, her voice soared over the clink of coffee cups and the soft bovine sounds of the ladies munching their dainties. Gertrude, she said, I tell you, there are some good but misguided people in this town, good but misguided folks in this town, who thinks they are doing right. I mean, now far be it for me to say who, but some of them in this town thought they were doing the right thing a while back, but all they did was stir them up. That's all they did. Might have looked like a right thing to do at the time, I'm sure. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not red in that field, but sulky dissatisfied. I tell you, if my Sophie kept it up another day, I'd have let her go. It's never entered that wool of hers that the only reason I keep her is because this depression's on and she needs a dollar and a quarter every week. She can get it. His foot doesn't stick going down, does it? Miss Maudie said it. Two tight lines had appeared at the corners of her mouth. She had been sitting silently beside me, her coffee cup balanced on one knee. I had lost the thread of a conversation long ago when they quit talking about Tom Robinson's wife, and I had contented myself with thinking of Finch's Landing and the river. Aunt Alexander got it backwards. The business part of the meeting was blood-curdling. The social law was dreary. Maudie, I'm sure I don't know what you mean, said Miss Mer Mrs. Merriweather. I'm sure you do, Miss Maudie, said shortly. She said no more. When Miss Maudie was angry, her brevity was icy. Something had made her deeply angry, and her gray eyes were as cold as her voice. Mrs. Merriweather reddened, glanced at me, and looked away. I could not see Mrs. Farrow. 
And Alexander got up from the table and swiftly passed more refreshments, neatly engaging Mrs. Merriweather and Mrs. Gates in brisk conversation. When she had them well on the road with Mrs. Perkins, Aunt Alexander stepped back. She gave Miss Smarty a look of pure gratitude, and I wondered at the world of women, Miss Smarty and Aunt Alexander had never been especially close, and here was Auntie silently thinking her for, thanking her for something. For what I knew not, I was content to learn that Aunt Alexander could be pierced sufficiently to feel gratitude for help given. There was no doubt about it. I must soon enter this world where on its surface fragrant ladies rocked sl slowly, fanned gently, and drank cool water. But I was more at home in my world my father's world. People like Mr. Heck Tate did not trap you with innocent questions to make fun of you. Even Jem was not highly critical unless you said something stupid. Ladies seemed to live in faint horror of men, seemed unwilling to approve wholeheartedly of them, but I liked them. There was something about them, no matter how much they cussed and drank and gambled and chewed, no matter how undelectable they were. There was something about them that I instinctively liked. They weren't. Hypocrites, Mrs. Perkins, born hypocrites, Mrs. Merriweather was saying. At last, at least we don't have that sin on our shoulders down here. People up there set them free, but you don't see them sitting at the table with them. At least we don't have the deceit to say to them, yes, you are as good as we are, but to stay away from us. Down here we just say, you live your way and we'll live ours. I think that women... That woman, that Mrs. Roosevelt, lost her mind, just plain lost her mind coming down to Birmingham trying to sit with him. If I was the mayor of Birmingham, I'd... Well, neither of us was the mayor of Birmingham, but I wished I was the governor of Alabama for one day. I'd let Tom Robinson go so quick the missionary society would have time to catch, wouldn't have time to catch its breath. Calpurnia was telling Miss Rachel's cook the other day how bad Tom was taking things, and she didn't stop talking when... I came into the kitchen. She said there wasn't a thing Atticus could do to make to make being shut up easier for him. That the last thing he said to Atticus before they took him down to the prison camp was goodbye, Mr. Finch. There ain't nothing you can do now, so there ain't no use trying. Calpurnia said Atticus told her that the day they took Tom to prison, he just gave up hope. She said Atticus tried to explain things to him and that he must do his best not to lose hope because Atticus was doing his best to get him free. Miss Rachel's cook asked Calpurnia, why didn't Atticus just say, yes, you'll go free, and leave it at that? Seemed like that'd be a big comfort to Tom, Calpurnia said, because you ain't familiar with the law. First thing you learn when you're in a law and family is there, there ain't any definite answers to anything. Mr. Finch couldn't say something, so when he doesn't know something, so when he doesn't know for sure, it's so. The front door slammed, and I heard Atticus's footsteps in the hall. Automatically, I wondered what time it was. Not nearly time for him to be home, and on Miss Missionary Society days, he usually stayed downtown until black dark. He dropped in the doorway. His hat was in his hand, and his face was white. Excuse me, ladies, he said. Go right ahead with your meeting. Don't let me disturb you. Alexander, could you come to the kitchen a minute? I want to borrow Calpurnia for a while. <clears throat> he didn't go through the dining room, but went down the back hallway and entered the kitchen from the rear door. Aunt Alexander and I met him. The dining room door opened again and Miss Marty joined us. Calpurnia had risen from the chair, from her chair. Cal, Atticus said, I want you to go with me out to Helen Robinson's house. What's the matter, Aunt Alexander asked, alarmed by the look on my father's face. Tom is dead. Aunt Alexander put her hands to her mouth. They shot him, said Atticus. He was running. It was during their exercise period. They said he just broke into a blind, raving charge at the fence and started climbing over right in front of them. Didn't they try to stop him? Didn't they give him any warning? Aunt Alexander's voice shook. Oh, yes. The guards called them to him to stop. They fired a few shots in the air, then to kill. They got him just as he went over the fence. They said if he'd had two good arms, he'd have made it. He was moving that fast. Seventeen bullets in him. They didn't have to shoot him that much, Cal. I want you to come out with me and help me tell Helen. Yes, sir, she murmured, fumbling in a apron. Miss Marty went to call Perner and tied it. This is the last draw out, I guess, Aunt Alexander said. Depends on how you look at it, he said. What well, was one Negro, more or less, among 200 of them? He wasn't Tom to them. He was an escaping prisoner. 
Atticus leaned against the refrigerator, pushed up his glasses, and rubbed his eyes. We had such a good chance, he said. I told him what I thought, but I couldn't. In truth, say that we had more than a good chance. I guess Tom was tired of white man's chances and preferred to take his own. Ready, Cal? Yes, sir, Mr. Finch. Then let's go. Aunt Alexander sat down in Calpurnia's chair and put her hands to her face. She sat quite still. She was so quiet. I wondered if she would faint. I heard Miss Maudie breathing as if she had just climbed the steps. And in the dining room, the ladies chatted happily. I thought Aunt Alexander was crying, but when she took her hands away from her face, she was not. She looked weary. She spoke, and her voice was flat. I can't say I approve of everything he does, Marty, but he's my brother, and I just want to know when this will ever end. Her voice rose. It tears him to pieces. He doesn't show it much, but it tears him to pieces. I've seen him when, when, what else they want him from, what else do they want from him, Marty? What else? What else? Who want Alexander? Miss Marty asked. I mean, this town. They are perfectly willing to let him do what they are too afraid to do themselves. It might lose him a nickel. They are perfectly willing to let him wreck his health doing what they are afraid to do. They are. Be quiet. They'll hear you, said Miss Marty. Have you ever thought of it this way, Alexander? Whether Makeham knows it or not, we are paying the highest tribute we can pay a man. We trust him to do right. It's that simple. Who on Alexander? Never knew she was echoing his twelve her twelve year old nephew. Handful of people in this town who say that fair play is not marked, white only. Handful of people who say a fair trial is for everybody, not just us. A handful of people with enough humility to think when they look at a Negro there, but for the Lord's kindness am I. Miss Marty's old Christmas was returning. A handful of people in this town with background, that's who they are. Had I ever had I been attentive, I would have been had another scrap to add to Jem's definition of background. But I found myself shaking and couldn't stop. I'd seen NPL prison farm and Atticus had pointed out the exercise yard to me. It was the size of a football field. Stop that shaking, commanded Miss Marty, and I stopped. Get up, Alexander. We've left him long enough. Aunt Alexander rose and smoothed the various whalebone ridges along her hips. She took her handkerchief from her belt and wiped her nose. She patted her hair and said, Do I show it? Not a sign, said Miss Marty. Are you together again, Jean Louise? Yes, ma'am. Well, let's join the ladies, she said grimly. Their voices swelled when Miss Marty opened the door to the dining room. Aunt Alexander was ahead of them. me. I saw her head go up as she went through the door. Oh, Mrs. Perkins, she said, you need some more coffee. Let me get it. Calpurnia's on an errand for a few minutes. Grace, said Miss Marty, let me pass you some more of those dewberry tarts. Do you hear what that cousin of mine did the other day? The one who likes to go fishing? And so they went down the road, laughing women. Around the dining room, refilling coffee cups, dishing out goodies as though their only regret was the temporary domestic disaster of losing Calpurnia. The gentle hum began again. Yes, sir, Mrs. Perkins. That Jay Grimes Everett is a modern saint. He needed to get married, so they ran to the beauty parlor every Saturday afternoon, as soon as the sun goes down. He goes to bed with the chickens, a crate full of ch sick chickens, Fred, says that's what started it all. Fred says, Aunt Alexander looked across the room at me and smiled. She looked at a tray of cookies on the table and nodded at them. I carefully picked up the tray and watched myself walk to Mrs. Merriweather, my best company manager. I asked her if she would have some. For all, if Auntie could be a lady at a time like this, so could I. And that's the end of chapter 24. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like, subscribe, comment below, and hit that notification bell. And stay healthy. And also stay tuned for <coughs> the summaries to chapters 19 to 24 with Sarah and Lils back there. Stay safe and healthy.